Did he crash before? No, I'm okay. Anyways, proceed. <gasps> Hello, everybody. My name is Delta Slit, and today we're doing a little bit of a reaction video, so we're going to be checking into something right quick from Overly Sarcastic Productions called <clears throat> Short Talk Small Mammal on a Big Adventure, which I'm going to assume is just all the Disney movies who have, like, small little rabbit and fighting against this, or, um, a very particular game that I've been seeing recently, or not even seeing recently, mainly the game that I had watched a friend go through as a playthrough was Small Saga, and it's literally small rodents. Um, so this is, like, speaking directly to me, because I just, like, okay, so it's not just, it's more like a few weeks ago I was watching them play through, but it doesn't matter. Anyways, Small Saga. There's this really widely held assumption that if a story has talking animals in it, it's mm -hmm. probably for kids. I mean, <laughs> grown-ups know that animals can't talk, obviously. So if mm. a charming little mouse or a whimsical rabbit or a talking cat or dog, their adventure will surely be something fluffy and shallow, unlikely to resonate like with the me. parents in the audience. What does a mouse in an ascot know of serious Sorry. things, like taxes or infidelity? Now, I'm not entirely sure where this <laughs> idea came from. I think it's an offshoot of the more broad idea that fantasy is for kids, which is something Tolkien famously fought against very aggressively. And Tolkien mm -hmm, did mm -hmm. the world a service by proving once and for all that a story could have magic and wizards and fairy tale motifs while still being very grown up, steeped in the horrors of a world torn apart by war, meditations on the petty selfishness mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm, people, staggering portrayals of the deep and invisible scars that war leaves on its soldiers, and the slow, monotonous agony of the march to the end of the journey. But because the only talking animals Tolkien prominently featured were noble eagles, the talking animal side of fairy tales didn't really get the post Lord of the Rings facelift the rest mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. joy. Wizards and elves and magic. Magic Rings got a nice precedent to be taken seriously, but talking animals stayed over in the Narnia <laughs> side of things, which, despite getting weirder and hornier what? with time and sequels, remained very- I haven't watched Narnia in- hold up. I think it was a robotics camp was the last time I watched Narnia, because we put it on while we were at lunch. And that little big- like, y'all know that fucking thing that you'd have in your- where it was like- the desk thing that you put the TV on and you'd wheel it out. So, like, that was the, we had Narnia on that because broke poor ass people is like, why do you have this not a regular TV? Uh, it's been around for years fixated on childhood as a necessary prerequisite for getting whimsically isekai into fairyland to kick it with God's persona. What I'm saying is talking animals still get stereotyped as a kid thing, despite a truly shocking number of stories that seem hell-bent on disproving that oh, yeah. rather obvious method of acknowledging the brutality of nature red in tooth and claw. Stories about mice, rats, rabbits, and rodents of all stripes have made their forays into <laughs> soaring unsuspecting youth whose parents saw a bunny on the cover and assumed it was baby-friendly. So, so I now want to read Watership Down due to the fact that you had that title right there. Here's your example. Also, small mammal, big and scary world. A familiar world is explored through the eyes of a small animal, frequently a mouse, allowing for small scale adventures as our protagonist navigates things the audience recognizes a new angle. Do or little. Anyways. <laughs> Let's talk about a very interesting genre that examines what happens when you take a small mammal and put them in a big scary world. The basic structure of these stories is Roger Rabbit. Simple. No, not Roger Rabbit. Um, is a familiar setting to the audience. Peter Rabbit. Something approximating the real world with farmers in their fields, cities mm -hmm, in their mm -hmm. sewers, and other such trappings of real life. The twist, of course, is that instead of following a human protagonist, the story focuses on a small mammal living in the nooks and crannies of this familiar world. The exact species of small mammal varies. Lots of these stories focus on heroic mice, with rats as de facto antagonists, but mm. some of them let rats be good guys too. Rabbits get a decent <clears throat> out of focus, and a certain book series I never got into oh, God. entirely on cat. I know so many people who got into this. I haven't checked it out purely because I was the one who saw it was popular and said fuck no. But for the majority of small mammal in a scary world stories, what matters about our protagonists is that they are very small, very fragile, and often rather unsure of the machinations of humans. And given that real world mm -hmm. humans have a tendency to kill small mammals that pop up in their spaces, a twist of extreme peril enters the narrative very early on. Mm -hmm, when mm -hmm, our heroes mm -hmm. are rodents or rabbits, humble farmers become existential threats, and cats and dogs become full blown monsters. While most yeah. elements of the environment will be familiar and mundane to the audience, seeing them from the perspective. I'm just realizing that, well, flushed. Does anyone even remember the movie Flush? It was one of those weird, like, fucking Pixar movies where, like, why the fuck is this movie about rats actually pretty cool? Also Django, but Django isn't about mammal, but I feel like it fits in the same category. 
perspective of something very small changes their perspective. Or was it Rango? Whatever the lizard a cowboy was. A can be home. A random seabird can be a vital and powerful ally. A half-filled mm -hmm. bathtub can be a deadly threat. This combo of quirks provides a very solid narrative basis. A world and setting the readers are all... Key, small manual trees. Small, so the familiar world looks big. Vulnerable, so familiar things are dangerous. Arsenal, ignorant, so familiar things become unknown. A danger strikes. Ooh. This produces dramatic irony. <laughs> Already familiar with needs no explanation. But since our POV characters are very small and very vulnerable, that familiar setting feels very different to them than it does to the audience. So the writer barely needs to exposit anything, but the readers still reap the benefits of dramatic irony, aka knowing mm -hmm. something that the characters don't. So the vibe of the setting is generally fairly consistent. The big scary world is some slice of reality, possibly with a little added magic or mysticism layered over otherwise very familiar architecture and environments. Where these mm -hmm. stories immediately start distinguishing themselves from one another is in how human the small mammals are. There's a steep feral to furry organization where some small mammal scary world stories have animals speaking English, wearing clothes, and even chatting with humans on the regs, and the other end mm -hmm. of the spectrum that verges on full blown xeno fiction, where the animals are completely animal and only minimal anthropomorphized by the writer for the purposes of translation conventions so they can write the story in English. And this has a huge effect on the feel of the story because it affects Okay, so I've seen the fully anthropomorphized version and I've seen layers in between, but I have not seen a fully feralized version or any stories that are just fully feral. And I'm kind of down to read one now. Yeah how the main characters see humans and the human world. And while these stories are not about humans, the role that humans play in the story is pretty central to the tone, on account of how humans are the primary audience for it. In a small mammal scary world narrative, humans can be anything from a total non-entity to an utterly mundane facet of the environment to an inscrutable cosmic nightmare. Mm -hmm, these are mm -hmm. tonally very different and shape the world in important God ways. Weapons. In the heavily anthropomorphized stories, where the small mammals are basically just small humans, real humans and small mammal humans might not really have any differences beyond scale. And and whether or not mm -hmm. they have to wear pants. In some versions, humans and the small mammals du jour will even be able to talk to one another, producing a world that resembles reality a lot less on account of how it has talking animals on good terms with talking humans. For instance, the yeah. tale of Despero has a very fairy tale vibe <gasps> that takes this angle. Oh my god, yeah, this is good too. Sort of knowing about each other's various civilizations and rules, even if some of the humans are occasionally surprised at a chatty rodent. For a more theoretically grounded setting, Disney's Rescuers takes this approach a little less overtly, where almost all animals can just talk to people and vice versa, but this doesn't seem to be particularly acknowledged or widely known, with the mouse civilization flying under the radar seemingly just because humans don't pay that much attention most of the time. And the humans don't pay attention cover is a fairly common implication in these settings, along with its corollary mm -hmm, concept, mm -hmm. that these stories are a sneak peek into the secret lives of familiar critters, and that these fun-sized heroes' journeys could be happening right under our noses in real life. It's pretty it's rare little bit of wonder. the background noise in these stories to be broadly aware of the small mammal civilization in any meaningful sense that would consequentially reshape the world, because the setting broadly resembling reality is one of its major strengths, which means all the fantastical elements, like rat construction projects or mice in waistcoats, need to be <laughs> hidden from the humans in the setting to avoid spoiling the illusion. Sometimes this is done fairly casually, with the implication that humans just don't notice small fancy mice running around in tiny copies of people clothes, which is the approach <laughs> they take in The Great Mouse Detective, where there's an entire parallel London with mouse versions of major characters like Sherlock Holmes and the actual queen, and the humans That's fucking just never funny really as hell. factor into it or notice. But in some stories, the heavily anthropomorphized small mammals might basically be a secret world urban fantasy, where their intelligence, civilization, and human-like qualities in general must be actively hidden for their safety. So the mm -hmm, world of the mm -hmm. story looks like reality, but only because the highly advanced small mammal civilization is purposefully maintaining absolute secrecy. This is the way they handle it in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Neem, where the world is explicitly meant to be reality, and the aforementioned rats are super intelligent, not because of suspension of disbelief, but due to garden variety genetic experimentation and are ah, of course, from humans course, while course, figuring course. out what direction to take their fledgling civilization. Our POV character in the book, Mrs. Frisbee, is basically I'm just an yeah, no, I've made mouse who is a rat OC. Oh, not a rat. It's actually a medicine, scaled and is squirrel. And the tech but, and infrastructure yeah. that the super rats have worked out. This is one example where the movie adaptation kind of completely changes the tone because the character designs get significantly more anthropomorphized. Like all the small mammals are wearing clothes all the time, including the slightly renamed Mrs. Brisby, who is not a genetically engineered super mouse and thus has no business wearing clothes. It's not just the pantification of the protagonist that contributes mm -hmm. to the vibe. The cinder block the Brisby family lives in is dollhoused up to look a lot nicer and more furnished, where in the original it's basically just a conveniently large rock with a nest in it. And that's not even touching on the 
magic amulet thing. I'll get what? The magic amulet thing. Anyway, in some of the more okay, I guess we're coming back for that. Stories, humans might not show up or be addressed at all, and the world is just populated by intelligent animals doing all the standard human things like building construction <laughs> and having prophecies of doom, which is the approach taken in the Redwall series, where the world just seems to be completely human free, like how the mice monks featured in the first book live in a mouse sized abbey built by mice. These stories could basically just be full on fantasy universes where the characters just happen to be animals instead of humans. Yeah, in that general, seems like it to me. Of a pattern of these more anthropomorphized stories. But like a humans are framed and corresponds with the degree of anthropomorphization. The more feral you get, dangerous, inscrutable, beloved, unpredictable. And then we have the other side, which is like peers, allies, enemies, inattentive, known factors, and irrelevant. I kind of like a mix of both, where people are going, oh, we are human beings, we are just as good, but humans are also cruel and evil, and they will destroy and dissect us. Focusing on the small mammal protagonists living among or functionally replacing humans, understanding them, even mm -hmm, mirroring mm -hmm. them, like Mouse Sherlock Holmes or the Mouse Queen of England or the Mouse Delegations from the Mouse United Nations. It's comedic, what? and of course everybody loves a tiny adorable version of a regular sized thing. Humans in these stories are usually either fellow protagonists, villains threatening those human protagonists, or just part of the background, too large and inattentive to notice our tiny heroes going on their tiny adventures. But on the more xenofiction side of the anthropomorphization gradient, Jesus. the stories angle on humans humans can get a lot more unnerving. And for this, we should start talking about Watership Down. Now, when I said that there uh -huh. was a gradient of anthropomorphization, that was true. But what I didn't mention is that most stories in this genre are clustered at the far end. At absolute peak anthropomorphization, we get things like The Dark Portal, which is a story where the mice mm -hmm. don't just wear clothes, they also have hair, and jewelry, and coming-of-age ceremonies. Just below that, you get the Disney Mouse movies, where mice typically mm -hmm. wear clothes, mm -hmm. have organized government, and then you start getting stuff like The Rats of Nim, where the critters don't wear clothes and are actively trying to find a way to live without humans but they are still in the business of speaking english and engineering electronics and then way, okay, okay. way at the other end of the spectrum skewing the curve completely is watership down now the characters in watership what? down are rabbits they do not wear clothes they do not speak english they are rabbits they worry about rabbit things like having enough food making enough babies and not getting eaten by one of the 1000 things that wants to eat them they have okay. the mythology and understanding of the world and because they are rabbits their creation myth is all about explaining why everything in the world wants to eat them and how they can be fast and tricky enough to not let that happen they certainly know humans exist humans are one of the things that try to eat them sometimes but the rabbits in the burrow don't really deal with humans that much and worry more about tangible immediate threats like foxes and unleashed dogs oh. so when a sign goes up yeah. at the edge of their field all they know is that the humans put up some wooden thing with markings on it they can't read english so they don't know that it says the field is going to become the home of a beautiful new housing development and they certainly wouldn't understand <laughs> what that means if they could read it they don't understand human construction work or this is or poison gas a all really interesting way to think bunny fiver loses his goddamn mind about the sign and panics and he doesn't understand it either he has absolutely no context to understand it but somehow he can feel that the innocuous sign is the herald of absolute destruction on a scale they can't even comprehend this is cassandra screaming the destruction of troy but rabbits throughout the book the rabbits encounter mm -hmm, many mm -hmm, things they mm -hmm. don't understand including cars which they understand as loud unbelievably fast animals that don't hunt them but do sometimes kill completely harmless creatures seemingly for no reason and a train which because it serendipitously wipes out some antagonists chasing them they believe was a literal act of divine intervention and this is interesting isn't it because the reader knows what all of this means even through uncomprehending rabbit eyes a reader can piece together hey what's up jack of hell i'm sorry i was just really paying attention to over sarcastic productions uh, aka known as Red, um, one of the many, many hosts of this. But yeah, what's up, Jack Pels? Um, we're checking out a very interesting set of like. Sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around this shit because like immediately we can think about this, right? Anytime where you have all these like rabbits and creatures inside, wash it down. My mom made me watch this when you're small. Ah, so you know this story. Congratulations. Welcome back to your childhood. Um, yeah, like, this is unironically really fucking weird to me, because I'm like, on one side, I'm like, ooh, this would be really interesting to write about. On the other side, I know that I'd be very fucking uncomfortable reading it, due to me just going, ah, so how do these animals die? Because this sounds like a really good way to fuck up someone mentally by just saying, oh yeah, you can tell read and watch the tragedy of how this rabbit gets hunted. What? 
Yep, free fuck story. Yeah, I, I assume so. Um, yeah. From the way they're describing it, they're standing on train tracks. They probably shouldn't do that. When a survivor of the original burrow's horrific destruction explains that the exit tunnels were collapsed and the air turned bad somehow, the readers know that a bunch of human exterminators probably came in with poison gas to wipe out the burrow before they broke ground on the construction site. This is the dramatic irony we talked about earlier. The audience has information, the characters don't. The characters hmm. are navigating a world terrifying and incomprehensible, and the danger is very real. And in many cases, the reader has a chance to figure out dangerous that most of the characters have no way of understanding, which produces a feeling of dread. The audience has a perfect understanding of the world that the characters are struggling to comprehend and survive. What we are seeing here is dramatic irony, cosmic horror, a combination I have seen in no other genre. This is like if we were the Eldritch Horrors reading the color out of space. Like, no little humans, get out of there! The color puce genta is very bad for organics! From the perspective of the- <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a perfect fucking example of what this is. It's that that's perfect. We this just lets human beings become cosmic horror. This is perfect. I now want to write it. I now want to write it. Ooh. If I have free time later, I might. The characters, it's an incomprehensible nightmare from the perspective of the reader. It's mm -hmm. common knowledge, but that won't save the characters. The characters experience cosmic horror, the audience experiences dramatic irony, and the writer barely needs to do any work to make it happen because the audience and the characters are just looking at the same thing from two very different angles. And the audience's expected familiarity with the setting of the story is a huge central element of the genre. It's just baked in. There's mm -hmm. a webcomic mm -hmm. called Scurry that I wanted to highlight here and spoil just a little bit. I think bit I've heard of that one. Illustrates this Wait a damn It's a very low anthropomorphization scene. No, I haven't seen it. Of mice Never mind. Out in an abandoned house, worrying about things like having enough food and not getting eaten by cats. And they're also worrying about how it feels like winter has lasted kind of longer than usual. And it's mm -hmm, been mm -hmm. really cloudy for so long that they've barely seen the sun in, like, ages. Yeah, and they're see you really later. low on food. And, you know, they mostly survive by scavenging food from human homes, but they haven't seen any humans in, like, a really long time. And all this is the radioactive waste, isn't it? The winter is constant and never ends. People are already gone, but they, for some reason, are just eviscerated. These rats came in after a fucking nuclear winter setting. Oh, fuck. All the houses they've been raiding are completely cleaned out, and they've sent a few scouts towards the nearby city to try and find more food or more humans, but those scouts never come back. And at one point, they find the body of one of those scouts, and he's just dead. He's dead. He went to the city, came about halfway back, and dropped dead. Huh. So... Clearly, something is horribly wrong. And between mm -hmm, an extra mm -hmm. long winter, a lot of dust in the air, absolutely no humans anywhere, and a major population center where getting close to it seems to just make you die, anyone who's been alive and paying attention since the Cold War has a pretty yep. good shot at diagnosing what happened here. Yep. Signs point to a little bit of a nuclear Armageddon situation, but how can we expect mice to know that? How can we expect Fuck. anybody not seeped in the post-Cold War cultural zeitgeist to recognize what a nuclear clear winter looks like. Well, luckily for our heroes, an explanation of the apocalypse comes after almost 200 pages from a possum that lived up close to the humans and witnessed the end of the world. But of course, she is a possum, and thus does not have anything resembling the complete context for nuclear Armageddon. So mm -hmm. from her perspective, the humans were struck with a plague of madness that spread all over the world and drove them to launch their most powerful weapons at the stars themselves. The possum struggles to explain what the retaliation of the stars looked like to the protagonist, who is a mouse, and a Eventually mm -hmm, describes mm -hmm. the resulting destruction as great wolf packs. First, a terrible wolf of fire feasting on the city and the humans within, the mere sight of blinding witnesses and driving them mad, and then a sky wolf that swallowed the sun and poisoned the land, killing many animals. This is a horrific and beautiful mythologization of a modern Armageddon through the eyes. That's actually really fucking cool. I now want to start creating extra myths that are just. Ooh, if I ever run another DD campaign. All the myths will just be inaccurate tellings of the past. Ah, oh, the gods rose and fell. And even a new one fell when, when the gods were struck from the heavens. They gave birth to the flames above. And that's where the sun came from. No, in reality, the thing that created the universe just killed another one of its kind. It blew up in space and then turned into a star. <laughs> 
eyes of something that cannot possibly understand it the same way the readers can. And while her narration is very mythic and broadly inaccurate, the visuals make it very clear to an in-the-know human audience exactly what is going on, or at least in loose terms, that there was some sort of political unrest, lots of rioting, followed by some kind of mutually assured destruction. And now, most importantly, the audience knows the shape of the threat and the world the protagonists mm -hmm. have to navigate. You run campaigns? Yeah, I was a DM for about a year and a half. Player here was one of my players. That motherfucker played a very homebrew creature. Um, if I'll list off the things that he had as a player, he had a fighter jet. Um, he had a storm barbarian with key, which allowed him to make storm lightning attacks and magical bullshit. Um, he was in canon due to the fact that he was always like leaving right before the end of sessions, but he would show up often. It was canon that he would just fade out of reality and come back. So that was just a thing in canon for him to just mid fight disappear. And one of the funniest fucking things was he had to go after doing a massive combo on a how do I say this? On on a fucking big bad. So like one of the big bads, he had his turn, went off, did basically only crits, just wrecked his shit. Like and the best part about it was Slayer had to come in for a little bit. He basically was like, Hey yo, I'm gonna deal with you real quickly. Whooped his ass, beat him up with some more, went into the air. They basically had a little fight in midair, and then before his eyes, he faded from reality. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> it was, it, it's, there's a lot of bullshit that happened in that game. Um, also, I really, I really want to be a druid, but only for plants. That's fair. So druid in my party was one of the most overpowered things ever, and I'm never, ever running a druid the same way I did, because I thought, oh, I'll let them have some leniency. Um, I didn't realize that when I gave the druid the possibility to get the same powers, later we're talking about D&D, &D, and I just told them the story of you teleporting out and beating up Silver Eagle. Anyways, uh, so. Yeah, let's get back to the video before I just got, you know, go on a rant is a constant danger, that the humans probably aren't coming back anytime soon, that the weather will not magically get better, and that the long-term prospects of the mouse protagonists aren't looking too hot if their plan is to continue scavenging a dwindling supply of canned food. Dramatic irony, cosmic horror. Also, just as a quick side note, but this is the most beautifully illustrated comic I've ever seen. I'd be seething with envy if I weren't so distracted by this beautiful snake texture. Give it a read through. There's a lot I haven't spoiled, and it's real pretty. In most storytelling, there's a bit of a fixation on making sure the readers can relate to the protagonists. We spend most of our time in or near the POV character's head, and surely that can't be comfortable if it's a head that doesn't fit. An unrelatable protagonist must be doomed to be seen only from the outside by an unsympathetic audience, says the conventional wisdom. No. The audience cannot care about their struggles if they can't feel and understand them therefore no i think one of the most interesting things you can ever do is read something where you don't feel comfy you don't feel similar you don't feel the same you're watching from the outside and you were looking inwards to think to yourself what the fuck am i going in why is this man no only suffering why have they only known joy why do i not any of the things that are going on i understand the emotions of all turmoil of stress that they have gone through but i do not relate to what is going on there has to be there, there's a lot of things you can do also even if you do not understand what's happening in the story you can enjoy the story due to the fact of what's going all around inside of that story what i mean by that is i may not relate to the main character but i swear there is a main character in any story that you can go oh shit i feel that or characters must be precision designed to be as relatable as possible. Mm -mm. What I love about this genre is how all of its most unique strengths are built on denying that. The more anthropomorphized and human, and thus quote-unquote relatable the main characters are, the less it feels like we're getting a fun new perspective on a familiar world, and the more it feels like we gotta start suspending our disbelief about talking mice. You can't get the unique strength of dramatic irony cosmic horror if the audience and the POV character are on the same page. It can only happen if the POV character regards what is familiar and known to the audience as incomprehensible, dangerous, and utterly beyond their understanding. And it proves that getting inside a character's head can be more exciting the more wildly different from the audience the character is. By relatable protagonist theory, seeing a familiar world through alien eyes shouldn't be fun. 
but it is. Mm -hmm, the absolute mm -hmm. central strength of this genre is how easily it plays with perspective, and it's always very cool to see that played to the hilt. If we can have fun seeing a familiar, relatable protagonist take on an unfamiliar fantastical world, it does kind of track that we'd also have fun seeing a familiar world through fantastical eyes. Also, Ooh. this isn't really central to the genre, but there's a very specific subtrope that crops up in these stories that I wanted mm -hmm. to bring up, mostly because I can't decide if I think it's funny or really annoying, and that trope is magic is real, but only for mice. See, stories <laughs> where the humans are inattentive, vaguely dangerous background monoliths, theoretically living normal, realistic lives in a normal, realistic world, will frequently feature the heroic small mammals dealing with explicitly supernatural things, like ghosts, prophecies, knocking mm -hmm, on magic mm -hmm. amulets, and even divine intervention. Some of it is just that tasty, dramatic, irony, cosmic horror, like the Watership Down rabbits thinking a timely train is an act of God. But mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. of it is actual... Full-blown magic, like Watership Down's oracular rabbit Fiverr and a quick in-person appearance from the mythical rabbit culture hero El Herrera at the end of the book. Magic but only for mice is oh. also a huge part of the novel The Dark Portal, which features everything from ghosts to oracles to acts of mouse god, producing an odd blend what of the grounding fuck? dramatic irony horror and fantastical out-of-nowhere horror. One of the major twists in that book is that the dark god the rats worship and serve is secretly the most horrifying thing they could ever imagine. A cat. A very fun revelation that is played exactly like a Lovecraftian <laughs> nightmare that actively drives at least one character irreparably mad, but then also the cat is a wizard and breathes- Oh no, that's even worse. When the literal- that actually explains why I said dark god and not like a dim god creation. I was like, oh you're just some random beast of burden, a thing created by the gods and thrown upon us. And then it breathed fire. Its breath launched across the ground rolling and burning like a spread of wild oil growing only more and it's just yeah i'm just bullshitting let me get on it's fire it just it's interesting i'm gonna make a redeem which is just me bullshitting a story whenever i want it. i don't really know how i feel about it on the one hand i almost think it weakens the impact of the story by reducing the familiarity of the setting and adding world building elements that the reader needs to have explained to them in order to get back to the dramatic irony that's such a central strength of the genre but on the mm -hmm, other hand mm -hmm. i love how it worked in watership down and how it added this mythical texture to the setting that never felt like it demanded further explanation and was instead just looped into the uniquely inhuman way the rabbits perceived the world around them something about horrific visions of future doom just feels like a very appropriate superpower <laughs> for a rabbit to have in a world full of things whose favorite food is rabbit like i would mm -hmm, entirely mm -hmm. believe that some rabbits can actually see the future and know how they're going to die look this hair in the eye and tell me that's not what it's thinking so I oh yeah no that's fucking horrifying is bad because i've seen it done really well but it does feel like it can kind of lessen the impact sometimes i do know why this subtrope happens it's because the secret small mammal civilization thing is basically just a reflavoring of the secret hidden magical world urban fantasy mm -hmm, trope. Mm -hmm. they fill the same secret space in the setting and have a lot of elements in common so layering one on the other is strangely easy the mouse civilization is already secret so it doesn't break the theoretical realism of the setting if the secret mice also hold up is it a bad time to tell you about mouse jesus <sighs> did jesus die for our squeaks did he die for our squeaks is is that what i'm not is that what i'm getting also have secret mouse magic. It just always leaves me with so many follow-up world-building questions. I can never stop wondering if the existence of rodent gods have broader implications about human religions, or if tangible proof of a rodent afterlife reflects on the world at large. But that, honestly, might just be a me problem. Maybe I'm just still mad about I like the world. idea the of different gods for different so creatures. aggressively focused on engineering and genetic mod- And humans just happen to be weird enough where we just made more and more until our book- Actually, that's kind of cool as they do for a story. Humans creating so many gods because we believe, right? Like, gods powered by belief. That's the thing that a lot of people would go with for a story. But what if we kept making more and more gods over time? To the point that our faith is so distilled or so spread out that it doesn't happen to be strong enough for any of them to exist anymore. So we killed our own gods by overpopulating them. Meanwhile, the rats and mice never decided to make more. They just kept the same one. That's actually really cool. Fuck yeah. Modification and the scientific method, and it really builds out this extremely plausible feeling. Mouse Jesus, one shot Jesus. <laughs> yes, to all of that. We'll
<laughs> I'm going to say this right here, right now. Like, have you ever heard of Mouse Jesus? Oh my, wait a second, hold up. I was going to say, what about, like, Mouse Moses? But I was, but then I realized his stick could be instead a worm. It could turn into a worm instead of it turning into a snake. Because that seemed like it would be really fucking scary uh, for a rat to just be like, you know what? Actually, no, that still fits. Shit. Moses turned his, that, his staff into a snake to make a point. So if, he tur if, so if the rat turns his stick into a big-ass snake, that still makes a fucking point. Create the entire Nim story totally faithfully, but then also the science rats have a magical telekinesis amulet. No follow up questions. This might be a weird <laughs> breaking point to have, but damn it, I like my stories totally consistent, whether or not the protagonists are talking rats. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. And now we have Red confused in their tonal change. Anyways, everyone, the links will be in the description. Go support them and check out their shit. Like, honestly, Red does a good job. Blue does a good job. Indigo does a good job. And the other colors, because I can't remember exactly which ones they have used or which ones they haven't. But please, everybody, have a lovely day. And goodbye. Oh, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Like this video if you enjoyed. Comment because you have something to say. Subscribe because you think you want to come back around support. And or you think I'm worthy of your subscription. And after all of those things, if you check out the link at the very bottom of the screen, that's my link with my socials. If you want to check me out on anywhere else, good job. One of those is my Fiverr if you want to commission me for 3D art. But please, have a lovely day. Goodbye.